couple of years ago, a Kickstarter campaign was started to fund research on Acropora any flatworms. Thanks to those of you who contributed to the campaign, the goal was met, and the research began. Now there's a scientific paper out on the Acropora any flatworms, and to get the facts straight from the horse's mouth, I've interviewed the primary researchers on the project. Now before we get to them, I want to say thank you for those of you who contributed to the campaign. This is an instance of hobbyists voting with their dollars and then directly benefiting from that voting. The hobby needs more of this, and this is a great start. With that, let's meet the researchers. My name is Kate Rawlinson, and I'm a biologist, and I'm based at the University of Cambridge in Britain, and also the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, which is in Cambridge. And I'm a flatworm biologist, and I do research into the development of flatworms, which includes marine flatworms, but also flatworms that parasitize and cause disease to humans. Yeah, my name is uh, Jonathan Barton. I am originally from uh, the States. I'm from Los Angeles. I uh, got, did my undergrad at Cal Lutheran, just uh, 45 minutes northwest of LA. And then I had the opportunity to come to uh, Australia, to Townsville, James Cook University, uh, to do my PhD. So I've been doing a PhD focused on the Acropora eating flatworm. Uh, and been lucky enough to work with Kate uh, and been fortunate enough as well to conduct my research at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. So Jonathan, your, your PhD is just on acridine flatworms. Yeah, that's my PhD. The first paper is out. I've read over it. Can you give me the rundown on the, the key takeaways of that first paper? So this is like the complete life cycle. We broke it down into three experiments. We measured, it, measured these at um, different temperatures to reflect the sort of temperatures you might find in a reef tank and also the geographical range. So you find these animals from the north of the Barrier Reef to the south of the Great Barrier Reef. So we looked at temperatures at 21 degrees, 24 degrees, 27 degrees and 30 degrees and we measured these parameters at these four temperatures. The first one was in two parts to see how long it took, or the embryonation period, how long it took to develop inside the egg capsule, then the hatching success, so how many of the capsules hatched to give rise to the hatchlings of the cooperating flatworm. The second experiment was to look at how long these hatchlings could live in the absence of coral, and this was sort of like a proxy for understanding how how long they could disperse for? Can they, are they able to survive for a few hours and therefore not disperse very far? Or can they live for days and therefore potentially disperse quite long distances between corals and tanks? And the third experiment was to look at the time to sexual maturity. So from when the hatchlings settle on the coral until we see the first egg capsules. Um, so that, that's the overview of the experiment we did to understand the different points of the life cycle and how temperature affects their development in order to try and understand when best to treat. So this is a summarise in our final, um, our final figure of the paper. And this shows you that an initial treatment can happen as soon as you spot the worms, as soon as you see the feeding scars or the eggs, you can then do a coral dip. So we give, an, we give examples of the timing of um, dipping depending on the temperature of your reef tank. A very loose rule of thumb, I would say, is to wait three weeks. So wow. if, you, if you look uh, at uh, in the paper at some of the cooler temperatures, if you treat it every two weeks, you could have some eggs that actually haven't hatched yet when you do your treatment. So you might treat at a too, too slim of an interval, I'll say, um, and you may end up missing some. So um, by waiting three weeks, it, as a general rule of thumb, um, you're not only allowing some coral recovery, um, Addition, sorry, some additional coral recovery time, um, but you should be able to catch them before reaching sexual maturity. And also our data can be used to determine fallow periods in your reef tank. So if you wanted to leave your tank acropora free to kill off any acropora eating flatworms that are in there, um, again, according to the temperature of your reef tank, you can work out how many days you need to leave your tank coral free so that any straggling acropora eating flatworms in the tank will eventually starve and die. And Kate, you said these guys have been found in the wild? Yeah, so in 2012, I worked with a, a coral biologist, again at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, and her PhD was to look at all the animals that live on corals on the Great Barrier Reef, or the epifauna, as it's called, all the animals that live in close association with coral. So I said to her, have you seen the acropora eating flatworm? And she hadn't, but she went out again and um, collected the coral heads to, to her surveys for a PhD, and she found them there. And so that was the first report from the wild. But since then, Jonathan has been out on the reef um, and found them in many more sites, haven't you, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, there, there really hasn't been a site 
that I haven't found them, to be honest. So one yeah. thing that I tell clients, getting a colony like I get out of Australia, it's different than if I go clip a one inch frag or get a one inch frag from mm -hmm. a wholesaler or even a retailer because the smaller you can see things. But it sounds yeah. like in your case, even if I blasted those, I may be able to see something. So the strategy of just buying small frags to prevent flatworms, maybe not as sound as I thought. Yeah, it doesn't really matter what the size is. They're camouflage, and especially when they're 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 really small. What we found in our experiments um, is you you really can't see the feeding scars until they reach a certain size. So um, even just trying to look for that evidence can be difficult. Have either of you found a way to get them to come off the coral, other than blasting? You know, we use coral dips, things like that. Do any of the dips actually work? So I'm actually, uh, I've been spending most of the day today doing data analysis um, on, on those experiments. So yeah, I, I, I ran the experiment with, I think I had 200 millipora fragments in it. So I've been monitoring wow. them, taking pictures every week. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll be able to kind of give, give the, the community a better idea once that's all done. The thing I would like to do in the future is, um... It's something we do here is, is sequence genome, sequence the genome of the acroporating flatworm. And then you could start to look for drug targets that specifically target genes of this animal, which would be very flatworm specific. Um, and you could you could co-opt drugs that are being used for other symptoms in humans and target specific genes. And so um, that's done a lot here with human parasites, flatworms here. We, we know their genomes really well. We can look at drug targets and, and then we can start doing assays with different drugs. So that's work for the next five to 10 years, really. Oh, five to 10 years, Kate. We need this tomorrow. We need this <laughs> now. We have to get rid of these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Jonathan's the man for that. <laughs> okay. Well, he's, there's no pressure. <laughs> he's a PhD student, right? He should be able to knock this down. He's young and got lots of energy. That's exactly how science works. <laughs> <laughs> Have we seen anything that's helping to eradicate them from the coral if the coral is infected? So that, that's so I, I actually submitted a paper on this last week. Um, so once it's out, I can say more, but I can tell you what I think doesn't work. Um, so there was a lot of excitement, including myself, um, just when I'm screening all these colonies and seeing, oh yeah, well, there, there's um, in the acropora, you get your um, tetralia crabs and thinking, okay, these acro crabs, these, these may be eating them, or, or the coral gobies, for instance, but um, I've seen too many corals that are absolutely full of both of these, but also absolutely full of the acroporating flatworms. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think that is, that is a promising direction, but um, I have found two animals that work differently that I think are promising, one of which, um, has been talked about in the hobby a bit, um, so it, it'd be good to provide some evidence. I'm sorry for being vague. I just once it once it is published in like uh, the life cycle paper, I'm I'm trying to publish all of um, the chapters of my uh, PhD thesis as open access manuscripts. So those uh, hobbyists or public aquariums or whoever is trying to keep a cropper is a, are able to go and read it. I'm sitting next to my 1700 liter reef tank here, and if I saw acridine flatworms, I've got plenty of big corals that are encrusted. I can't just remove that guy and mechanically blast them off. So if I blast them in the tank, does something have to eat those guys? What's the effectiveness of me blasting it and then those guys getting swept away as opposed to me blasting it and then landing on another coral and getting somewhere else? A lot of fish will take a bite out of anything sort of flo floating in the water column, right? So even fish that may not say patrol your coral trying to remove flatworms if they get blasted off they'll come and and have a feed the reality of the situation is uh, there's no easy fix if you have a well-developed huge reef um, that has become heavily infested if we have them in our tanks what about just letting them coexist in your tank as plenty of other things that we probably don't even know about. Could you still have a nice reef tank? Or are you just always going to be fighting them and losing colonies? Where do you sit on that one? On the reef, they have this proper balance. And the more we learn about the organisms that uh, will naturally consume them, the more than that we can get closer to striking that balance in our reef aquarium. 
um, you can artificially help maintain that balance by um, that regular sort of blasting off of your corals. And that's not to say that you need, I mean, especially depending on the size of the reef, you don't necessarily want to blast all of them at once. Maybe, maybe you're every couple of days moving across your tank. Um, but if your fish are eating them, you're going to be suppressing the population. So um, you can strike a balance where you can have a healthy reef that still does have the flatworms, but it is a, I think at, at the current moment, it's a bit of a tightrope. If we can yeah. identify some biological controls and employ them, um, in addition to that sort of mechanical removal, um, you can be able to do that. But obviously, if you're able to actually re remove your acropora from the tank and, and dip them at that interval, um, you're going to have much more success. But it's it's not an easy feat. And, and following on from Jonathan, so, you know, each um, worm can lay egg cluster which has any like on average about 15 egg capsules and in each egg capsule there's anywhere from one to five embryos and so if they're turning over a generation in 38 days in just over a month you know you can go from a few individuals to hundreds of individuals within a month um and while that might be more manageable in the wild in a captive system where your coral is already a bit stressed it might that that could be the end um quite quickly there's the rapid population boom of afw in your reef tank could overwhelm the coral. Um, so it, it, it was startling really how productive they are, um, how many eggs they can lay and how many embryos in each egg capsule on each egg cluster. It's really, they, they just, uh, when, they, when they're mature and they've got enough coral to feed on, they could produce hundreds and thousands of, of offspring um, within in, a very short time. Following on that, connecting with the paper, um, our experiments with the um, the hatchling uh, longevity, we're able to see that, in fact, these these larvae are able to swim um, quite well. I'm not saying they're gonna they're gonna swim against the current of an MP40 or anything like that, <laughs> but um, g given the flow required, for instance, in a tank holding, let's say, let's say an SBS dominated system, um, there's plenty of flow to rip them around and get, put them in contact with other corals. So um, that has implications for connectivity between systems. For instance, say you have a, a frag tank plugged into or plumbed into your display, um, and you get a fragment off someone. It's maybe you haven't. Hopefully, you've dipped it and screened it. But um, if you were to get an infestation start to break out in that frag tank, um, it is completely conceivable that those larvae are actually able to travel up into the display. But well, um, what corals? What acros are most at risk? I haven't found species that are particularly vulnerable. Um, a lot of people have mentioned certain corals. Um, there's um, a coral that they call uh, the D Dallas Acro, or which looks a lot like I said it would, in the states, the really similar looking to the the, the I think Bali Green Slimer they call it. Yep. Um, yep. But there's there's no evidence to really back it. So um, well, there may be some that are more susceptible. I've seen so much variation within an individual species um, that uh, yeah, I wouldn't be able to confidently say there's there's one that's um, more susceptible than another. I think it more comes down to how healthy the coral is uh, in in the aquarium.